I, I started reading about the things that are falsehoods and started realizing that a lot of the narratives I'd adopted my whole professional career were total nonsense. Like, for example, that the, psychi the psychiatric medications work and they don't work. They are the, they, psychiatry is a strange specialty. It's the only specialty in medicine that has a substantial group of deniers that don't even think they should be in business. And the reason is that they they have done they have they're they're deploying these very powerful and toxic drugs and they have no decent studies they have not done placebo controlled trials on these drugs because the placebos are no good because 17 percent of the damn country is already on the drugs so they can't find a person to give a sugar pill to right so the only controls we have are the third world where they don't have enough money to buy these you know five dollar pill drugs or whatever they are and in the third world the outcomes are better for the different disease states than they are in the united states in other words these things wax and wane in, in their natural history is to go up and to go down you've got bipolar you may be bad for a month but then you get better well the drugs render the our patients chronic and the social security disability rates have risen in tandem or at the same time almost exactly as the increase in medications prescribing has occurred. And, and people think this is causal. They think it's a, a, a cause of the, the worsening chronicity of the, the diseases that we're prescribing these drugs. No, this is cognitive therapy. And it's, it's a, a person to person, personal contact thing, which is probably better done, uh, not over Skype, but in, you know, where you can touch somebody. And so it, it's been done for millennia, and it's not the whole merit narrative of the the drug the hell out of yourself uh, with the uh, uh, modern drugs that are that are cost a fortune and are reimbursed by insurance. It's crazy. Yeah, and, and let me say, now Doc said this is cognitive behavioral therapy. Let me say, I'm not doing any therapy on here again. He's just saying that there are mechanics that are recognizable, and they use the same principles in cognitive behavioral therapy. But believe you me, this these same things, and I believe Doc alluded to it, these same things are you can be observed across the oldest, most ancient uh, spiritual practices to ever exist. You know, when you talk about the uh, Buddhism and the Maya, and it talks about the illusion of the mind, a lot of, uh, as a matter of fact, the fathers of, of psychology, you know, when we think about uh, Freud and Carl Jung, they studied the spiritual practice of deeply religious folk and then combined that with the science of, of therapy, psychotherapy, psychology, and what they knew about the mind to formulate hypotheses. And that's how they became uh, frontiers of a new era of psychotherapy. So there is truth there. This is not about, and I'm not saying, I know I'm saying spirituality and not religion. I'm not trying to tell y'all go convert to something. I'm saying that they are spiritual truths that time and time again have been proven to be uh, just as, as, as sure as gravity. You know, you know, I know cognitive behavioral therapy is actually a thing and I use it more as a generic uh, descriptor. And I, I, and I think uh, pastors and counselors of all kinds use something like that. And the main thrust is to get the people aware enough so they can modify their own behavior by using their, their thoughts and feelings and, and being cognizant of how their, their, uh, their, you know, their, their ideas and so on influence their behavior. So that's what, that's what it sounds like you're doing. And that's bravo. You know, it's not a freaking medicine that addicts you and ruins your ability to function. I was in a multi-level security prison in the capacity of a mental health clinician. And I was over the maximum lockdown area. Um, and these offenders, um, they, some of them were real, real, real hell. I've had, I've had, I've seen some things back there. And I also seen some of these same individuals that take the medication afterwards. Now, some of, a lot of them are med seeking now they're, because they, they come in with substance abuse uh, issues, but they are given the medication and at least no one gets stabbed in the middle of the night, you know? So in, in, in a situation, I know that this is, that's not the general public. We're talking about prison now. So in the context of a correctional facility, would you, would you recommend removing all the meds out of correctional facilities as well? I've never, 
I never said anything like that. Um, I, and of course, the rights of society and the rights of other people have to be taken into account when you're deciding about whether to give medications to an individual. And the way psychiatry is gone is they they give it one month injections and they last the stuff lasts for an entire month and all they have to do is chase the guy down once a month and give this injection. And of course they've marked that up. They've marked the old generic drugs up, put it in injection injection form, claiming a new patent and thousands of dollars in injection. So in a very similar question is what we do about the nursing home patients. Well, in Los Angeles, these people are frequently on 20 prescription medications apiece. And that is not a nursing home. That's a medication farm. And they're keeping them alive so they can continue the Medicare payments for their medications. I mean, it's it's an outrageous situation. There are people that have developed specialties in trying to decrease the number of medications that each person person takes. And antipsychotic use, atypical antipsychotic use is ubiquitous in nursing homes. I mean, it must be, it's well over half, it's probably over 75%, it might be 90% of the, the people who are out of it get these drugs, and it's just for staff convenience, so they don't cause trouble. They don't have to tie them down as much and so on. Maybe it's worth it and maybe it isn't, but it's 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 a mess. And there are, there are people who opine that it would be better if these darn things were never invented, and then we'd know what it was like without them. But we don't know what it's like without them. We have to cope with what's going on now. Why do you think it's so difficult? And this is definitely the main to the conversation, and maybe this will help, help, help some people that need this question asked. Why do you think it's so difficult for people to believe, even if presented with factual information? Well, we're facing a wall of propaganda, Harry. I mean, it's an amazing, amazing thing. Hormones, we have used hormones in therapy for a hundred years, thyroid for 120 years. It's amazing. And we've used testosterone, even growth hormone. We have a 50 year history of using cadaver growth hormone. And they, these things work very well. We have good studies about them, but they have been opposed by nefarious sources. Now, I, I, the industry's fingerprints are all over this, but it's hard to trace down exactly what's happened. But you, you do know that the FDA is entirely in the pockets of big industry because since the early uh, 2000s, the FDA has been paid by ind industry sources through user fees, which are fees that they incur along the patent drug process. So the FDA has come to regard the industry as clients rather than entities to be regulated. You get it? So the FDA is in the pocket. So the FDA put these warnings on these hormones claiming they were, they caused heart disease and strokes and all this stuff. And they're just not true. We've got newer reviews of the material and they call it a pack of lies. They use studies that looked at this at the things through the wrong end of the telescope. In other words, they took they found people who already had heart disease who happened to be taking testosterone and studied them. That's not the way to do a study. You take a population and you you check on everybody and give half of them testosterone, the other half, uh, you know, n nothing or something like that. That's called uh, double blinded things. So, so the industry has used all these. Um, statistical tricks uh, described by Goldacre to uh, adulterate or kind of ruin their conclusions, either to help them uh, prop up their drugs or um, to run down their competitors. I mean, it's an amazing scene, and I describe it all in Butchered by Healthcare. I'm you're a rebel. I love it. I love it. I love the, the fact that you're a rebel. Let me say that. That's the reason why I wanted you on a premiere, because I am also a rebel. I am also a rebel, and that's why. And I know that the, the most dangerous thing that that corrupt uh, institutions, the most dangerous thing to them, are truth tellers. All the people that I admire are truth tellers, be it Gandhi, MLK, Nelson Mandela. And notice, and I noticed that with all of the people that I admire, their fates were not the most desirable ends. But that's because the truth is dangerous, and so I definitely wanted to give you a platform so you could speak that truth.